Thank you. Can you guys hear me fine? Yes? OK, great. So um, by way of introduction, my name is Mark Zorns. I'm one of the founders of Winnow. At Winnow, we believe that food is too valuable to be wasted. And we believe that technology can fundamentally transform the way that we make food. Um, the idea from Winnow really came out of some work that I was doing while I was at McKinsey & Company. Um, I had been in food my entire life, but had not really realized how much food is being wasted. Um, and it's about a trillion dollars a year, which is a big number. It's over one and a half percent of global GDP. Um, and there's hardly anybody doing anything about it. So three years ago, um, I left to found Winnow. Uh, we put uh, technology into kitchens to help them understand what they're wasting, analyze that data, ultimately cut food waste in half. Um, so basically, our business model is, on average, when we go into our client sites, we find that they're wasting about $30,000 a year in food. Okay? Um, when we put in Winnow to monitor their waste and give them tools to be able to drive that down, ultimately they're able to cut this in half. We've done this coming up on around 300 times. Um, we've got clients choosing to roll our system out across the UK um, and on an international scale. Um, and there's a really clear value here that we're delivering to them that shows up in their bottom line. So to focus on this problem, um, there's over $1 trillion a year of food that's wasted. I said that. Um, I guess to think of it from an environmental perspective, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And if you were to look at the hospitality industry, um, there's over $100 billion a year in kitchens that are thrown away, commercial kitchens that are in the business of transforming food into something that you want to buy to be able to make money. Um, up to 20% of the food they buy is wasted, and that's effectively because they are inefficient factories. Um, and about two-thirds of that actually happens before it gets to a plate, particularly in areas where they pre-prepare food. So we specialize in businesses that are mostly in the contract catering space, so anywhere that services schools, universities, staff restaurants, hospitals, stadiums. We focus on big hotels um, and the buffets they put out, as well as the kind of meeting and banqueting that they do. And then we focus on any restaurant that actually pre-prepares food. And we do that because they make too much, and they don't track it, and they are therefore throwing away a good portion of their bottom line. Waste happens because, first of all, it's really hard to measure. So a few of our clients, for example, Compass Group, before we came, were literally counting how many buckets of food waste they generated. This is a over $20 billion a year company that is operating in, I think, over 100 countries with almost half a million employees that the most sophisticated way that they understand their biggest loss in their business is by counting the number of buckets that it fills up. Okay? So we solve the problem of actually accurately and easily monitoring that. When they could actually get people to provide a bit more detail, they were asking them to fill out spreadsheets or handwritten documents that never got analyzed and actually failed as they were being completed. Um, so the tool that we put in place is what we call a smart meter for kitchens. It's effectively a connected scale that sits where food is thrown away. As staff throw food away, say when they're clearing down a lunch service and they're throwing away a hot main they can't keep anymore, they throw it in the bin, the change in the weight goes on the bin, they tap that was hot mains, that was the beef curry, uh, and then it plays back the value to them of what was wasted and then transfers that data up to the cloud to sell that data onto the chefs or, 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 or share that data with the chefs. It works, first of all, because it is simple and intuitive. To put anything into a kitchen, you have to make it literally work for the lowest common denominator you can possibly imagine. We've had people jump on scales. Um, we've had all sorts of things. But we have everyone right now from a two-year-old, because we're trialing at homes, up to an 80-year-old using our system without a problem at all. The second thing is it's optimized for kitchens. These are very busy places. The largest uh, site we operate in the UK is actually the HSBC Tower in Canary Wharf. They're doing about 10,000 meals a day at that site. They're spending about 10 minutes interacting with our system across 40 staff. So you can do the math and say it's not really that much time to use our system at all. What they're saving in terms of not making food that they otherwise would have been wasted is multiple times the amount of time they're investing and actually just putting in place the right monitoring tools. The final reason is that it gives direct feedback to staff. So if you were to put a phenomenal chef in a relatively small kitchen, you would probably find that they wouldn't waste that much because they would be quite mindful of it. The problem is when you try to actually scale that up on a business perspective. And you've got five people, 10 people, 20 people, 
all having to become accountable for the waste that gets generated in a kitchen. And when you help make the people understand the cost of that and give them metrics to understand how they're performing, you can really drive change and a fundamental behavior change across the operation. So this is an example of how the system works. You throw the food in the bin, you say it was, that came from the um, plate that was unserved, it was the chicken special, it, it plays that value back to them. That's the first place that we, that we drive change. And then of course we provide the analytics that come off the back of that. Um, this is just an example of one of the reports. I, I won't go through that. Um, the fact is, is that with our business, we're delivering concrete, repeatable results. Um, so it's about a $20 billion cost saving opportunity in our target market that we're focusing on. That would save over 8 million tons of food being thrown away per year. Um, because the food industry is throwing away up to 20% of what they're buying, or the kitchen industry, and because the margins in that industry are anywhere typically between about 5 to 10%, that when you effectually cut food waste in half on what we find on average for our sites, we're improving the net profits of those business by anywhere between about 30 to 60% when we go in. So this is a big deal. For one of our clients, we've calculated with them that we could actually increase their share value by about $3 billion when we scale it up across their entire business. Um, over the first 200 kitchens, we're saving 2.5 million pounds in food costs, delivering anywhere between a 2 to 10x ROI. You can see kind of the curve of what we tend to deliver when we go in. We make very quick results very quickly, um, and then we help them sustain that over time. Um, we work with companies come such as uh, Compass Group, IKEA, Accor Hotels, Centara, which is a, 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 a Thai hotel chain, Elior, and then Marriott. Uh, just a couple examples of that. Um, Compass was our first client. We've just closed the deal with them. We're going to be rolling our system out to nearly around 300 sites in the UK. Um, Accor, who we just started working with in November, based on the evidence that we saw with them, actually put into their global targets to cut food waste by 30% by 2020. So they decided what we saw with them in a few hotels that they were going to actually make a public commitment to their shareholders to cut food waste across the board. Uh, we now operate in 10 countries. Um, a year ago, uh, when we first, well, actually about a year and a half ago when we first started getting with mustard seed, we were in one. About five months ago, we were in three. Um, we've really started exploding mostly with the hotel trade that we've been doing. And so I guess one of the questions that was asked is this whole idea around social enterprise and kind of what does it take to actually scale something up. And I heard a conversation earlier kind of around, well, what is a social enterprise, right? And kind of what makes it a for-profit business and is that a good thing or a bad thing and should it be a non-for-profit if it's still solving a social good? Um, I think that, first of all, if you want to create scale and you believe that one of the fastest ways to create scale is to attract a lot of capital to a problem, then one of the most tried and tested ways to do that is to just get a business model that works and stands on its own two feet. Now, what Mustard Seed invests, invests in that I subscribe to is this idea of what, of what they call a lockstep business model, which to me makes a lot of sense. It's basically saying you are a for-profit company, but you directly make your profits by solving a social problem. So the more money we save our clients, the more food waste we are preventing. Our social mission is to prevent food waste. The more our clients are saving, the more they're willing to pay us. It's very simple. There are no trade-offs, right? So when, when Teddy said that they don't believe there's a trade-off, this is an example of a business model where there literally is no trade-off. Our number one metric from a social perspective is how much food waste we're reducing. Our number one sort of revenue perspective or sign of our business growth is how much food waste we're saving. We, just, we, we don't have to make those choices, which, which is a luxury. I think the second thing about that in is, is actually to find what is a scalable business model. What I see with a lot of social enterprises is that you look at a problem and you find a way to solve it in a relatively small niche, but there's not a real question of if this really works, how do I scale it up across the world? Personally for me, I rather, if I'm gonna focus my time on solving a problem, I wanna focus on a, on a problem that I can solve on a global scale. And so very specifically with Winnow, we did not go a consulting route. We made choices, and I think it is a conscious choice as you scale your business to actually think about investing in how you're going to grow in a way that you can replicate. Because going out and finding ways to be able to help people that takes a whole lot of labor, if you're not figuring out the end business model that you can multiply times a thousand when people say they really want it, then you're probably going in the wrong direction. And putting those constraints on you allow you that when you do get it right, you can make a real change. 
Um, I think the, th the third thing, and this is a, a very, very um, sort of common saying for, for Paul Graham from, from Y Combinator, is obviously make stuff people want to buy, right? What three words, I think, talked about it with Chris. He said, you know, first they talked about what they did, then they actually talked about why they did. People don't care what you're doing. People really don't care your motivations for what they're doing. People care about some, a problem that you're going to solve for them. Right? And I think too easy, it's very easy as an entrepreneur to get caught up around your story and the journey you've been on and how you're going to make that work. But you're just going to be pushing water uphill if that's going to happen. Really find something that people want to buy. Find that sort of core point when you're solving a real problem. And then everything else is going to take care of itself.